Hey everyone, welcome to the next session of Citrix Converge. Uh, my name is Ramesh AK and I'm joined here by my colleague Nitin Joshi. And we are from Wipro Technologies. And in this session, we'll be walking you through uh, our topic, which is solving real world problems and selling it within the enterprise with Citrix WSI. Uh, why did we choose this topic? Because, uh, well, the Citrix WSI is a great platform to make a lot of micro apps in. The challenge still remains in getting it, uh, selling it within you know your local IT or you know within enterprise IT, and then getting the adoption going, right? So we just wanted to talk to you today about our little adventure that we had, uh, where we you know ended up creating a new micro app for a very specific use case, and you know how we actually ended up selling it for the enterprise IT, right? Uh, so in terms of the session today, uh, you know you know it's it just going to be divided into four parts. You know I'm going to briefly introduce Wipro, uh, then talk about the problem statement that we had. Uh, our approach to how we got together, you know, to you know, down that path, and then essentially the solution that we made using Citrix WSI, right? So, you know, let me just briefly begin by introducing us. So, we, uh, you know, both Nath and I come from Wipro Technology. So, Wipro uh, is one of the largest virtual workplace services provider in the world. Uh, we do around about 1.4 billion dollars worth of business in providing digital workplace services, a core component of it, process mobility. And uh, essentially creating, you know, you know, what we call a digi hub, but essentially a single pane uh, for all productivity applications for end users. And we manage about seven plus million users in 38 languages all across, all across the globe, right? Uh, so that, you know, that's in brief about Wipro. But let's get to the next problem statement, right? So let's look at the problem itself. So, you know, the problem actually came to us, uh, you know, in one of the governance calls that we had with, you know, one of our service desk teams, right? So there was this user who had called up the service desk and, you know, this was actually the problem statement. The user asked, hey, uh, you know, and he told the service desk, hey, I can't really log into my remote machine. The, you know, they had a machine set up in the office, the user was working from home. And they said, look, I can't really log into that machine in the office because the office machine goes to sleep. Now, who do I contact an IT to power on my machine? Right. And, you know, that might sound to be a strange use case, but the context for that, obviously, as you can guess from all the people in the background was COVID. Right. Uh, so due to COVID, uh, you know, this was a, you know, a BFSI customer, banking and financial services customer. And essentially they had, uh, you know, users who, you know, had their primary in the office. And these were connected to some very critical applications in the office, which for data security and regulations purposes, you know, they couldn't really publish the information out. Uh, and these users were logging in remotely and then logging back into the application, right? Uh, now, you may ask this, you know, why couldn't they have gone to the VDI route? So they had gone to the VDI route. Uh, it just so happens that, you know, our uh, dear friend, the user here, had left a little bit of data out there on that machine, uh, strictly against policies, of course, but he had left a little bit of data and he wanted to access it, right? Now, this is not such a surprising use case when you think about it, right? And, you know, these are usually the interesting use cases because it deals with something which is really, really common, which is, you know, human behavior, right? So IT can make all the policies in the world with the best of all intentions, but users are going to be users. They are going to do, you know, all these little, uh, you know, variations to, you know, the way IT expects them to work. And that's what really makes an interesting use case because, you know, the most powerful use case is where you help a user go back and solve the problem, right? So when this came up to us from the service desk perspective, we said, hey, look, so this, this really is interesting. Uh, because, you know, there could be more users who are down this path. So why don't we go back in and this? And this, you know, was a good problem to solve, right? Uh, you know, you know, we've been making, you know, micro apps now for quite some time, right? Even before Citrix WS, I mean, uh, we're making micro apps on multiple different, uh, you know, technology platforms, right? So, you know, I can count, uh, you know, on the fingers of both hands, all the technology platforms that we've been using, right? Be it Xamarin, be it Python, be it, uh, you know, uh, Ruby, right? So, you know, there are pockets of developers within Wipro who've all been making these micro apps, and, you know, they have all their different platforms from Unily down to, you know, something custom grown out of Azure on which they publish these micro apps. But, you know, the common thread around all of this is that, you know, there are specific problems which are really, really good for micro apps to solve, right? And these problems are problems which have low IT complexity and high user complexity, right? So what do we mean by low IT complexity? Look, so if you were to take the use case, right, where somebody wants to wake up their machine, that's a low IT complexity case. There are multiple tools out there in the market which can do it. Right, so you have wake online solutions. You know your commercial uh, solutions like Oni Night Watchmen. 
or to the worst case, you know, uh, IT can just basically pop on a script onto SCCM and then you know trigger all those machines to wake up. So that part of the problem is actually solved, right? Uh, but you know, the complexity comes in from you know the way users expect to use the service, right? Uh, for a lot of users, right? So there are no predefined work patterns, right? I mean, we all like to believe we work nine cross five, but that just isn't true, right? So some people may work the nine cross five shift in the morning, some people may work the midnight shift, the graveyard shift. And some people, you know, just may work a shift where they just got up to go to the fridge in the night for a snack. And now they just feel like working, right? So there's no accounting for user behavior. So, you know, wherever there's low IT complexity and high user complexity, that essentially becomes, a, you know, a, a good problem to solve. And the reason we say that is simple. Uh, so what we have here is what we call the Wipro magic box for, you know, what's a good micro app, right? We can't call it the magic quadrant because that's obviously a trademark by Gartner. So we call it the magic box. Right, and and the way we look at it here is that you know all those use cases are divided into four blocks, right? So there's a low IT complexity and a low user complexity, right? So you know it, it, it's it's a problem that IT can solve, and it's a problem that's not going to vary from user to user, right? And their IT automation obviously you know wins hands down. It's easy for IT to go back and manage it, uh, pop a script into SCCM. Uh, you know, or find some other automation tools to basically go back and do it, right? But that's something which is really easy for IT. So if you were to go to IT with these problems, they're going to say, you know what, I've already solved it. That's right. So I don't need a micro to go back and solve it. Uh, then there are problems which is high IT complexity, but low user complexity, right? So, you know, I want, uh, uh, you know, a, a system which basically gives me on-demand applications which are posted on-premise, right? So high IT complexity, IT now has to put out their thinking caps, figure out about demand, load, virtualization, how, you know, how many instances, etc. all of it. It's high IT complexity, but low user complexity. So they're going to get done, but you know, the kind of budget and investment that's required for them, you know, that's going to really take a long time for IT to work it through. So, you know, they may go off into an RFP process or something else. So, you know, chances are if you've got a problem like that to solve, you, you know, it, it is going to hit a roadblock. Ultimately. Then there are those, you know, where it's high user complexity and high RT complexity, right? And out here you have another challenge, which is, you know, you know, just the complexity of user requirements and the technology complexity is going to make this really complicated. So these are the projects where you're going to have a, you know, a minimum viable product and multiple release cycles. Uh, so again, great uh, fit for micro apps. But you know, one of the biggest problems there is making sure that you know there is enough value for the micro app. So because MVP, you know, is minimum and it is viable, but it's not really going to delight your user experience, right? So it's a fine, you know, balance between getting all the features out on time uh, so that you know users are delighted by it, but making sure that you don't you know kill all of your developers accidentally through stress, right? So that's you know another roadblock here. But problems with low IT complexity and high user complexity, right? Where you need a lot of personalization. That's a great fit for a micro app, right? So, you know, you can just go write it. IT loves it, business loves it, your end users love it, right? It just fits everybody's needs and, you know, and, and it's a micro app, right? You don't really have to waste a lot of time, spend a lot of cycles. It's easy to, you know, put it together and then basically go and deploy, right? So that's essentially, you know, how we go back in and evaluate all those use cases. And from that perspective, this looked to be a really good use case because IT had already solved the problem of how to wake up the machines. The only thing that was left to do was to figure out how users could come back in and wake up machines at different points of time, right? So, you know, so we so we determined that it was a good problem and, you know, we were going to see the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, you know, by solving this problem. So we said, okay, let's go ahead and then step onto it, right? So we ended up writing a couple of user stories, right? So. You know, this is a user story. So in our user story, so you know, between me and Nathan, we are great Liam Liam Neeson fans. So Taken is one of our favorite movies. So you're going to see a lot of Liam Neeson in all of our user stories, right? But we made out this user story for Mark, and you know, so here's Mark. Mark has a very particular set of skills. That's from Taken, and he works as an investment banker, very proficient with Excel and Outlook. Uh, but he's using a MacBook Pro in his house, and he for you know an odd set of reasons his company doesn't have VDI, uh you know citrix account manager so that's your clue there for this organization but uh you know he just wants to go back in wake up that machine log on to it and then get working right and unfortunately the machines in office have all these power settings so you know he really needs to wake up this machine before he can get any work done now mark is one of those very meticulous and very fit people so you know he would ideally like to uh, you know, wake on that machine when he's out on his morning run and then come back in and then log into it or when he's getting his cup of coffee right at his desk. So it, it needs to be both available on a mobile app 
and it also needs to be available on the desktop, right? And the question immediately popped up. So what happens if Mark has multiple machines, right? Because users do, right? Some users have, you know, three, four machines, you know, spread out all around their office. Uh, right, if it, especially if you're looking at you know investment bankers, you know chances are they got one machine tucked away, you know under the desk, one machine you know sitting somewhere in a closet. So, so there are multiple different machines, right? But essentially, we were able to boil that user story down to these two requirements, right? For mobile, have a single app that shows all machines assigned to Mark, and then allow Mark to go back and power on, reboot, hibernate those machines. And for the desktop, have the same app again, uh, but Possibly through a web browser or you know something which Mark can basically easily access and give them the same functionality on it. Now, one of the things uh, when we did this was you know we actually talked to you know the user who had that problem, and as we we're talking to other groups of users, one of the requirements that did come out was you know the ability to have notifications that yes your machine was actually switched on. So for a lot of users who were doing this, uh, you know they used to switch on you know wake online used to happen, but you know maybe the signal was not getting down into the machine. So, you know, they used to try five minutes, then after another five minutes, then after another five minutes. So 15 minutes down, then they used to call the IT services and say, hey, my machine is not really up. All right. So having the ability to have real-time notifications that your machine is powered on, the status of the machine, that became really crucial for users because, you know, it, it just gave them the reassurance that, yes, things were working and it allowed them to plan the rest of the day and the rest of the week. Right. So that's, uh, you know, very critical from a user requirements point. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I'm taking this from my home, so uh, you may have a little bit in the back. Now, what was our approach to this solution, right? So the first question, you know, is which platform should we develop it on? Uh, and the reason for that is really simple. Uh, there are multiple different platforms uh, out there which Enterprise IT has, right? And, uh, you know, all of them have functionality. Enterprise IT has invested a lot of on it, uh, you know, a lot of money as well as time on these platforms. So the crucial thing is, uh, you know, you know, having that conversation with enterprise IT to figure out what that platform and what features that platform needs to have, right? So the first part of it is, uh, you know, uh, which platform, right? So the first feature was that the platform needs to be AD aware, right? Uh, so, and that's crucial because, you know, for lots of enterprises, you know, the AD becomes the way they do the whole identity lifecycle. And entitlement for applications, entitlement for services, all happens through AD, right? And it, it's usually set up very nicely with a shopping shopping storefront for end users. So making sure that the entire application was AD aware became really crucial for us, right? So the platform needed to support it. The second was, you know, it needed to be a right ones that run it across different form factors, right? I mean, that's crucial. Uh, it goes without saying today, but you'd be surprised, uh, at, you know, how many different platforms, you know, have so many variances in it. Right. The third thing was that it, it also needed to have a very good API integration, right? Um, because obviously, right, uh, we would have to talk to different systems out there in the world. So, you know, these three became, you know, very crucial factors in terms of evaluating the platform. Right. So when we went to IT, enterprise IT, right, they said, hey, uh, you know what? We have just, you know, we, we have multiple platforms which, you know, uh, comply with all of your requirements, right? And they showed us service now. Power apps and Citrix for this, right? Now, ServiceNow was the first platform they asked us to go back in and evaluate, right? And ServiceNow is a great platform, right? Uh, so, for, for one, it's, it's it's completely idea aware, right? So, the way enterprises usually set it up, it's integrated to Azure AD uh, or on premise AD, uh, you know, users are synchronized, groups are synchronized, so entitlement really becomes easy, right? And uh, in terms of the, you know, the API hub, it has a good API hub. Uh, it supports both V1, V2, plus you know the user context too. So it, it's, it's really easy to build certain things in service now, right? And if such a seller was listening to it, uh, you know that's that's like a big request from our side. Please do feel free to include both to user context and next version of Citrix WS. You will make our lives really, really simple, right? Uh, but one of the sticky points with service now, and you know that conversation you're going to end up having is what do we do about the mobile front end, right? So service now has a rich legacy. It, 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 it's multiple different products. And one of the challenges was, you know, what should be the front end for mobile developers? What should we target? Now mobile app, NATO mobile app, service portal app. And that became, you know, kind of a sticky point between going back and evaluating service now. But the deal breaker, right? And you know, this is this part of solution, right? Is that for most enterprises, service now is usually handled by a completely different third-party service provider, right? So how much enterprise IT wishes and wants to get the latest most brilliant set of features into the hands of its users, 
uh, they are always curtailed by the development cycle that that service provider is following on their service now, right? Uh, so you got to align to the sprint cycles. You got to align to you know a specific way of doing things. So kind of agility uh, that you know you're aiming for from a micro app perspective. You know that kind of goes out of the window. So that's a deal breaker for us from service now. And believe me, so as you go back in and create more of these micro apps, you you could find those opportunities where you come up, you know, you know, head to head with service now. But that's certainly something that you need to evaluate uh, because you know that can you know push a lot of what you do, uh, you know, to the right, right? So you can you can include a lot of delays as far as your program is concerned. Uh, the second platform was Power Apps, right? So Power Apps, you know, from Microsoft, uh, uh, you know, pretty cool platform. You know, obviously it's tied to the hip, uh, it's joined at the hip with AD, right? So Azure AD, Outcome AD, Power Apps works very well with it. Great API hub support for V1 and 2. Uh, but then the sticky point here was, you know, that kind of flow-based licensing, right? Uh, so the way Power Apps is licensed, some, you know, number of flows, and that became you know, some somewhat of a challenge in terms of you know trying to figure out how much the whole project would cost. So what happens if we use a chicks in price? Price? How many you know number of you know power ons and power offs should we assume for that user, right? Uh, and that kind of derailed the discussion we had with our customer, and we said that okay, you know that, that's a problem. Again, just like service now, right? Uh, you know, power apps is something that's jointly owned both by IT as well as business. Right, so it became kind of a mishmash of trying to figure out, you know, who should I go back in and ask for approval if I want to publish it uh, to the users, right? Should I ask business? Should I ask IT? How does this happen? And the larger the organization, the more you're going to find out that, you know, doing the micro is the easy part. It's 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 this part, you know, that that's actually going to be a kicker, and that kind of became a deal breaker for us. So then we went to the customer and said, you know what, you know, it's it's, it's so easy, we can just go back and do this on AWS side, right? And the customer came back and, you know, gave a thrill for the simple reason that, you know, for a good, I, I would guess most of you, most of our customers, uh, you know, the Citrix relationship is, you know, wholly and solely controlled by IT, right? So it became very easy for IT to, you know, say that, okay, so we just want to have this micro app platform and, you know, you can come back in and develop all of your applications on it, right? It, 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 you know, you really didn't need to have permissions or go back work with third party vendors or do it, right? So IT could move at its own pace. Now that's an underrated feature that Citrix doesn't really talk about from a WSI perspective, but I think that's really crucial uh, because, you know, that makes or breaks the success of the app, right? How quickly you can get your users is usually a measure of how successful the app is. And, you know, on this respect, uh, you know, Citrix WSI just scores, right? So. We have this dictum within Wipro about you know shipping enterprise apps where we say that you know feasibility is a feature, right? It's not just shipping. The sheer fact that the app can exist, you can get it to work with all the different stakeholders, all the different people within the enterprise. So feasibility, if, if, if it's feasible, then you know, that's worth its weight in gold, right? And with Citrix WSI and Citrix micro apps, you know, that becomes so much easier. Uh, because you know the stakeholders involved are you know so limited. So you know that's essentially you know a a, a, a very good reason, you know, to go back in and then choose this platform. Right. So, so there we went. So, you know, uh, we had decided on the user story. So, you know, you had all your little users out here. Some of them would come back in on the desktop applications. Some of them would be there on the mobile applications, and they would talk to the Citrix WSI platform, right? And now the question came back in. Okay, so Citrix WSI could talk, but what would it talk to? Basically, switch on and switch out those machines, right? So. What we did was that, uh, you know, we evaluated a component from Intel called Intel Emma, uh, which would essentially allow us to come back in and switch on and switch out those machines, right? Now, let me just give you a brief about what Intel Emma is and what Intel Emma does, right? So Intel in its wisdom uh, has for a long period of time, you know, with every i5, i7 or Xeon processor, been selling a little chipset which you know sits right there on top of your central CPU. Which actually, you know, provides you know, a, you know, an onboard a microchip keyboard video monitoring system for the entire machine, right? So uh, what the chip does is that you know, independent of whether your operating system is up or running, it can essentially boot your system, switch off your system, send it to sleep, send it to hibernate, and essentially even act as you know, a kind of remote control, you know, into that, uh, you know, into that machine. Right. So, and this is available, uh, you know, even if, you know, irrespective of whether the machine's booted up or not, right? So, you can uh, have a machine which is you know, not booted up, just lying on your desk, uh, connected on a LAN to your router or even on the Wi Fi to your router. 
and you know all of this is still possible right so we chose this because you know for a lot of our customers right in fact 95 percent of our customers uh, are still you know a windows shop right uh, sorry about that apple but you know they just a windows shop right and while we expect that the apple numbers will climb uh, you know enterprise it is still very very intel specific right so there we were with you know the whole intel mr so intel mr itself consists with very simple architecture there's a server sitting out there somewhere within the customer's data center and you know so it's a, it's a very small set so it can basically be a small docker image or it can just be you know one or two vcpus and essentially it connects back to all of the machines in the customer's estate uh, you know they have an i5 v pro or an i7 v pro or a xeon uh, chipset in there and it can essentially provide you know uh, very unique encrypted commands to you know power on the machine hibernate shut down or even you know uh, you know power off that machine right so all of this can you know essentially be provided from that mr server itself now you know, if, if it just had that, uh, it would have been a great tool. But Intel MR also over the years has also picked up a huge set of APIs, right? So, uh, you know, so everything from, you know, configuring the network certificates for Wi-Fi drivers, right? Network certificates for the Wi-Fi on the chipset, uh, all the way from, you know, from that down to essentially powering on the machine, controlling the machine, uh, in fact, you know, rebooting the BIOS, all of that are available as a huge set of APIs which essentially uh, we could go back and an access, right? And that became, you know, the, the, the choice point there. So, uh, you know, we had WH side, simple, because, you know, it was very easy for us to get to, you know, into IT and get into the hands of users. And then we had MR because, you know, it just provided us a, such a good mechanism for integrating it back with WH side. So that allowed us to set the preliminary architecture in place and say that, okay, so we're gonna go with Centrix WH side and then with Intel MR, and then uh, you know have that deliver all of those power instructions back to end users. So that's from the architecture perspective, right? So now all that was left to do was to just power on you know cloud.citrix.com, go in and then start writing an application, right? But when we had to do this, uh, you know, so there were a couple of design decisions we had to take, and you know these are design decisions you know you will also have to take you know irrespective of which micro app you're writing on Citrix WSA platform. Right. So I just handed over to my colleague Nathan here to talk about, uh, you know, what are those different design decisions and, you know, how we went about solving those issues. Over to you, Nathan. Thanks, Ramesh. All right. So as rightly said uh, by Ramesh, so uh, uh, we had a couple of challenges and decision factors uh, which we came across uh, during the building of the app. Uh, the first problem we had uh, was how to authenticate Citrix WSI with Intel MR app. So we have two options uh, available. Uh, one is Azure AD um, uh, integrated uh, with Citrix WSI and Intel MR. And uh, uh, both of them get integrated with Azure AD in a single uh, security context using OAuth, OAuth uh, version 2.0. But only challenge was uh, uh, which we currently uh, saw during the building of this app that Citrix WSI does not have uh, support for OAuth 2.0 in user context. So to overcome that particular problem, what we have done, we have implemented option two, which is actually our current authentication method uh, between uh, the Citrix WSI and the uh, Intel Emma app. That is the using the application based token uh, where we have two separate security context with admin access and the Intel Emma control access. Right. So, so, you know, so that becomes a solution. Yeah. So, so I just wanted to add that, okay. right. So that becomes crucial because, you know, for enterprise IT, having, you know, two security contexts, uh, you know, in, in certain cases, it just becomes that little bit more difficult to, sell it to corporate security, right? So, you know, the security teams now want to know why it can't just be one. Uh, so it becomes that more, that, that little bit more complicated. And, uh, you know, uh, it essentially means that, you know, there's little security context on the token-based authentication. Uh, that needs to be really well-documented and you need to, you know, essentially have, uh, you, know, multiple, uh, you know, multiple security protocols around that, right? So how quickly will the token refresh? Uh, you know, how do we set the timeouts on that? So that puts in a little bit more pressure out there on you know the system that you're going to be setting up this integration. So things to keep in mind, uh, you know it, it's it's easy to set up this integration, 
but uh, when you need to go back in and then you know push it into the enterprise uh, you know all your security guys are going to come back in and then you know uh, and then merely drill away at what the security implications here are so do keep that in mind uh, you know when you basically planning your project it actually took us uh, you know around about four weeks of you know very heated discussions before we were able to convince security that yes uh, this would be secure but do you know factor that into your plans whenever you're basically making that micro one sorry it doesn't back to you thanks so uh, uh, Actually, to achieve this uh, uh, option to uh, authentication system and uh, to also uh, solve the user context problem. So we have what we have done. We have created a customization uh, in terms of uh, user context layer by ourselves to have the user lifecycle management defined uh, through Citrix uh, control pane. This is to provide access control on micro micro app level to entitled user and the subscribed users. And I will explain this in detail in my subsequent slides. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, Ramesh, can you just uh, uh, switch to the next slide? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, not this one. Yeah, this one. So, uh, I'm going to uh, tell about the second problem that we have. That is a user context problem, where, uh, uh, where like how we will access the Intel Emma app in user context, as I said in my previous slide, that Citrix WSI does not support OAuth 2.0 in a user context currently. To overcome this problem, we have created a user device mapping database layer using ServiceNow uh, integration, where we, we are using ALM asset data table, which is actually an asset database table, uh, with, by default available in ServiceNow uh, with the asset management module. Uh, or uh, uh, ServiceNow expert says that CMDB CI database, uh, and this can be accessed directly through the ServiceNow REST API calls within this uh, Citrix uh, uh, WSI app. So what we have done means uh, we we have the other option also to utilize the user data from the identity management that is Active Directory uh, over the Azure or maybe the on-prem Active Directory. Uh, for creating the mapping, but that method is a little complex in terms of creating another middleware layer using uh, means uh, layer for creating uh, uh, for getting the data from identity management and then map, create a mapping uh, uh, in uh, Citrix WSI database. So to uh, and that can achieve that can uh, be achievable by by using our uh, homes uh, Wipro homes orchestrator, but to reduce the complexity of the solution. We use the straightforward method of mapping the device data and the user data directly from uh, which, which is directly available from ServiceNow as a database. So I'm going to explain the how we have done that uh, mapping uh, of the data with the uh, with ServiceNow database with the asset table and the uh, WSI uh, micro app uh, for Intel Emma. So uh, that is uh, okay. Uh, yeah. In the next in this slide, I'm going to tell uh, that how we have done the merge uh, activity for uh, both of the tables uh, from asset database and from the endpoint table uh, of uh, our uh, Intel Emma app. So for creating, uh, we have relationships available in WSI apps, uh, micro apps. So for creating a specific relationship where we have both of the major fields, one is the user ID and the other one is the endpoint. So why we need this relationship because we uh, this uh, the application should know that this uh, or xyz machine is actually assigned to which user so that particular mapping we need from uh, uh, service now asset table and then we have created a relationship between uh, the service now table and the uh, intel emma uh, database table endpoint table so both of the entities uh, uh, get merged with uh, using the machine ID, which is uh, by default common uh, in both of the tables. So those that will be used as a primary key here. And uh, then we, we are fetching this data, uh, relationship data into our micro app uh, uh, application, Intel, uh, Intel Emma application using the filter called uh, user email. That is by default available in, uh, uh, in our uh, uh, Citrix WSI micro app. So that that filter is actually uh, segregating the data for the end user uh, and displaying only uh, user context data in uh, when when user is actually get, get subscribed to this app and only he or she will get 
their machines in front of their screen. So they will not have the access on to, uh, uh, access to the other uh, uh, endpoint data, data for the other users. So that is the main idea of creating the uh, mapping of the user, user ID and the device ID. So uh, Ramesh, if you want to add. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So as Nitin uh, mentioned, right? So, so, so there's three critical parts, right? So one, uh, we are setting up your app, uh, you know, the security context, how you're going to do the integration, that becomes one of the critical, you know, things that you need to, you know, worry about because, you know, that's where you spend a lot of time, uh, you know, a lot of cycles at least, uh, you know, prior to basically deployment. The second is, you know, uh, you know, doing that mapping, right? So it, it, it's it's very rare that you're going to find out all of the information that you need uh, on one single application, right? Enterprises are just not built that way. So we don't just believe in having, you know, three different normalized tables uh, or even three different normalized databases. Just, just for the sheer thrill of it, you know, you're going to have data, normalized data sitting on three different systems altogether, right? So when you're doing it, uh, you know, be prepared, uh, uh, you know, if you're lucky, all of the data you need is going to be available, you know, through one REST API. If not, uh, you know, you are going to have to work with a couple of, you know, orchestrators to pull out the relevant data that you need uh, and then get it through a REST service. So that again becomes, you know, something which is crucial. Uh, you know, when we started building out micro apps, we really didn't think that that was the most crucial point, but, you know, that essentially becomes make or break. And the third thing, uh, and, and, and especially with email, right? And, you know, this goes without saying from an email perspective, which email you pull out becomes absolutely critical, right? So when you're talking to AD, uh, you know, it's, it's so easy to pull out, uh, you know, not the FQDN for that email ID. It's just easy to pull out the mailbox part. And, you know, we wasted a lot of time, uh, you know, doing that too. So make sure that you pull out the right uh, email ID, right? So you're, you're going to have edge cases, right? We, we had edge cases where, you know, a single user had multiple different mailboxes. Right. So then, you know, the, the big question became, which one do we take? Which was the primary mailbox? So digging through that, finding out what the customer's, you know, schema for storing information, that's absolutely crucial. And then the third thing is obviously, right. I mean, and, and believe me, right. So from a micro app, however much we like playing around with the pages, I think this is where we spend all of our cycles. It's in basically figuring out how to merge those tables, right. So, uh, you know, Certrix WSI brings this very, very powerful tool to start merging tables and, you know, doing joins across multiple different tables. And that just makes life so much easier because you can now, you know, you know, we picked up the user, e you know, we picked up the user email and the machine ID from the service now table, uh, you know, merged it or, you know, basically established a relationship with back with, you know, Intel M on the machine ID and then use the user email ID as a filter to go back in and ensure only relevant machines for a user, right? So, you know, we did all of this, right? So you may be wondering at this point of time, what does that actual app look like, right? So let me just flip my screen and then show you what that actual app looks like. And there you go, right? So I'm just going to play this video. It doesn't have any audio on it, but I'm just going to, you know, watch this over. So when you look at this application itself, right? And we're just going to scroll down here a little bit or look at the most recommended yeah, settings here, but you know, we're just going to scroll down here. This is essentially what the Intel M app looks like, right? So it takes a minute to load, but essentially you're going to see all the endpoints which are assigned to the user, right? And then, you know, machines with a live connection. So the reason, you know, that you have these two sets of data is simple. Uh, machines with a live collection are ones where, you know, we're already sending out uh, a pre trip to wake them up, right? Fixed WSI, right? So users can come back and select that machine right and you can see the power state uh you know the amt version uh you can also see the endpoint id and you can basically go back in and select all those machines right you can yeah so we you know we just love basically showing all the details so far after very proud of it right but you can select one of those machines and you can actually go back in and then you know, handle mission whichever you want, right? Shut it down, I it, reboot, uh, you know, you know, even go back and then perform a remote session back with it, right? So this can be really showing you what a remote session looks like. So, you know, that's Nathan out there showing you the demo. And all that you need to do is to go back in here and 
you know, scroll out and, uh, you know, just go back in and then take remote control of those machines. Right? So that brings us to the conclusion. So you know, the whole demo is out there. Uh, you know, we are hoping that we can load it up somewhere on the Citrix session website, so you can go back in and take a look at it. But uh, you know, that's essentially you know what we have from the Emma demo itself. Now, uh, what is our roadmap and our plans for this little micro app, right? So I'm just going to flip back to the slide here. So number one, uh, right? So we've done all the hard work. So the Vipro Intel, Vipro Intel Emma app. We really have to think about a better name for this, but we have done all the preliminary work here. Uh, so you know you don't have to write the code for this, but it's available now on the Citrix marketplace, right? So you can go back and download it, set up the couple of servers that you need, and then play around with it. Uh, you know even within your environment, right? But you know what we're planning to do is you know create you know some kind of uh, controls or you know you know virtual machines on Citrix cloud. So that enterprises who are already ready customers can come back and uh, you know you know split up those two instances and then get the full benefit of the micro app plus all of Intel are right from within the Citrix control plane, right? The third thing, which is obviously our roadmap, is to beautify the interface. So uh, you know a good interface really, really sells. It makes it so simple for users to figure out what's happening. Uh, unfortunately, our interface doesn't look anywhere close to you know what we aim for. But you know we're hoping to basically beautify the interface uh, you know over the next couple of weeks. Uh, the fourth thing, uh, and this is something that we are now, you know, getting our hands, you know, dirty with, and we are playing around, is to integrate the Citrix chatbot with Emma. Right? So one of the coolest features we thought was to come back into your chatbot, type out, and then say, hey, you know, switch on my machine or switch off my machine, right? I mean, if I had a feature, I'd just go play around with my machine. I wouldn't do anything else the whole day. But you know, this is one of the features that we are planning to add in there. Uh, you know, the next thing that we want to do is to make sure that we can integrate this in a very native way with Citrix WSI. So where you see my desktops and you can see the you know the virtual desktops, we want to basically build this integration in so that you can see a combination of both your virtual desktops plus your physical desktops, uh, you know, in one single way. So that's essentially you know the kind of roadmap that we have with Intel Emma, and uh, you know we'll be working on this over the next couple of uh, you know weeks and months as time progresses, right? So I hope this session was informative for you. Uh, I hope you basically uh, you know heard a little bit about our adventure in terms of how we basically ended up building this little micro app and you know how we took it into the enterprise uh, we will be there in one of the virtual hangout rooms in case you know any of you want to meet up with us and you know ask us more about our stories but you know thanks again to citrix for giving us the opportunity and see you soon